5. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The title of the message is A Spiritual Vision for the Local Church. We will be looking at the doctrine of the church from its spiritual perspective. It's a very practical doctrine, a very important doctrine, in light of the fact that we will be having our annual business meeting after the worship service. It's very good to have a regular review and reminder of our spiritual priorities because there's a furious battle going on. I don't know if you realize it or not. To preserve the spiritual life of the church and our individual lives. The Bible reminds teachers and preachers, individual believers, parents, that we all have a ministry of remembrance. We're to remember certain truths and doctrines and spiritual commands from the Lord because we often forget them. And we're also to keep up practicing these truths and these commands. And so it bears out frequent reminder that we bring up these truths and these commands. And so typically we review our church goals once a year, and we will do that again in this message. Now, a local church, by way of introduction, that strives to be faithful in doctrine and holiness has always been the object of Satan's malice and his wrath and his destructive schemes. His purpose is to destroy the church or to make them so ineffective that he doesn't have to worry about them. He doesn't have to focus a lot of his time attacking them, seeking to destroy them. Over time, many churches have ultimately succumbed to both the wiles of the devil and to prolonged spiritual deadness for many, many reasons. And that's why it's important for us to regularly have a vision renewed for our spiritual priorities corporately. I'm speaking primarily corporately today. Certainly there will be many individual applications from the six points I will briefly, hopefully briefly, bring out today. Because many of you have heard these points many, many, many times. And each year when I, I usually touch upon these goals of ours and our spiritual priorities, I try to approach them from a slightly different perspective. We don't want to bore you. But to the spiritually enlightened mind, these should be always truths that thrill us, that excite us, that quicken us, and remind us of our spiritual priorities. Our generation is no different to previous generations among those who have succumbed to the wiles of the devil in the area of losing our spiritual vision as a church. I'm not saying we have, because I don't believe we have. I believe that God has been gracious to us in enabling us to maintain our vision. But our belief in the truth and our zeal for the glory of Christ and our ability to maintain our spiritual priorities can temporarily be forgotten. And our generation is no different when we confront this temptation. In fact, it's my opinion that the level of apostasy in the church in general and the worldly distractions and temptations facing the church of our generation have rivaled the most spiritually corrupt generations in history. At least they're the same, or even perhaps a little bit, a little bit harder on the church of our generation because the enemy has more tools at his disposal to magnify the lure of various temptations today. The church's spiritual life in most places today is extremely weak. And to a certain degree, that's always been the case throughout church history. But it seems to be more so in our generation. And so it behooves us as a local church to take heed. To take heed. And to be warned from 
the weaknesses of other churches. Not only are we to be encouraged and to be inspired by the positive things that are going on in the church today, because there's many positive things going on. I thank God for some of the preachers of our generation who have the burden to write books and preach sermons that exalt the person and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ and to encourage their fellow preachers to preach Christ. And I've been benefited. I've benefited by many of them. But also, there's negative things that we need to avoid as local churches. And spiritually minded believers today are shocked as they observe the level of idolatry and immorality and worldliness that has come into so many churches. And the unprecedented level of sophistic sophistication and subtlety in its deception that has drawn the church away from her first love. But the local church, our local church, and all local churches must hold on to its spiritual life at all costs or we risk being cast aside as useless and morph into an organization that is just religious in nature with very little or no spiritual life. God has proven in many ways and he's demonstrated throughout church history and in the scriptures that he will give a church over to their own ways their candlestick will be put out. They will be turned into what God calls in the book of Revelation a synagogue of Satan, which is a very scary term if we don't maintain spiritual life. Are you hearing me, brethren? There's a massive lack of discernment and wisdom in understanding the need to preserve the spiritual life of the church as well as the issues of life and death that are connected to the spiritual needs of this local church and all local churches. Spurgeon said, an unholy church is useless to the world and of no esteem among men. It is an abomination. A useless church is hell's laughter and heaven's abhorrence. The worst evils which have ever come upon the world have been brought upon her by an unholy church. In proportion as a church is holy, in that proportion will its testimony for Christ be powerful. What is the purpose of the local church? And do you understand the Bible's teaching in your relationship to the local church and in your commitment to serve God as a member of the local church? These are important questions because the church is a spiritual institution designed by God to accomplish spiritual purposes. You and I as members of Christ Bible Church are ordained by God to bring forth spiritual fruit. He's designed a plan for the church for you and I to participate as ambassadors of Christ, as co-laborers with him, as 1 Corinthians 3 teaches, as 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 6 teach. We are designed by God to be a channel of life and a tool to bring forth spiritual fruit. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I ask you, are you participating in God's plan with the Lord Jesus Christ to be a channel of life in the local church, to exercise your spiritual gifts and to bring forth spiritual fruit with those gifts and in your membership and relationship with the other members of Christ Bible Church? Very important questions, questions that come up throughout the epistles in the New Testament over and over and over again, especially the Pauline epistles. And so there, <clears throat> these important questions, every believer must ask himself or herself every so often. And you won't be asking these questions of yourself that often if you don't read the scriptures. Because the scriptures frequently, especially in the New Covenant scriptures, bring up these issues of spiritual life and the spiritual priorities of local church. But if you stop reading 
about the doctrine of the church and our commitment to the local church as members and our role in serving God in the local church, you will tend to forget what these priorities are. So it's important that every believer ask himself or herself, especially those seeking a church home, those of you who are listening by way of internet, Unfortunately, many churchgoers don't ask these questions, which in the end have a huge influence for good or evil upon our spiritual lives. The local church in the plan of God to build his kingdom is designed to have a huge impact in the lives of local churches and individual believers and in bringing forth spiritual fruit that redound to the glory of God. And so local churches and their leaders are to focus on accomplishing these spiritual goals and these spiritual purposes of God to, that would ultimately glorify him in this world and in the world to come. So it's an important question to ask when you're seeking a local church or if you're attending a local church regularly, upon what doctrinal and spiritual foundation is the church to be established and built upon? What is the doctrinal beliefs of the local church? Is there spiritual life there? Am I challenged? Do I regularly have a visitation from God prompting me, quickening me, reminding me deeply within my spiritual being of the spiritual priorities that I have individually and as a member of the local church? There are three goals for the local church. First, what are they? What's the first one? The glory of God. That's why we were created and saved, to glorify God. It's the first question asked in the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why you and I were here. That's why we're here, rather, and why we were saved and created to glorify God and to enjoy him spiritually, his union uh, or union with him and his fellowship. Secondly, the salvation of souls. There's to be light and heat vertically between us and God in our relationship with him. That's how we glorify God in our walk. But horizontally, we glorify God through sharing the gospel and seeing souls saved through our outreach with the gospel, the salvation of souls, through sharing the gospel, through watering that gospel whom others have shared with, uh, others have shared in their lives by reaping souls, the salvation of souls. Are you involved directly or indirectly, somehow, some way, through your word and through your lifestyle in sharing the gospel so that say, souls can be saved? If you're not, why not? Ask yourself that question. Number three, the third goal is the sanctification of the saints. So when you look outside the church, your relationship with the world, you're to be sharing the gospel leading to the salvation of souls. But when we look within the local church, we're to be involved in sanctifying others through the use of our spiritual gifts, and we ourselves are to be sanctified by others exercising their gifts in my life, including the pulpit ministry. The spiritual ministries of the church and the spiritual priorities of the church are predominantly designed to sanctify the members and the body. So our ministry directly or indirectly, not only behind the pulpit and through our prayer meetings, but our ministries in each other's lives, by showing hospitality, by helping, by praying for one another, and in many other ways are designed to bring forth edification and sanctification. And when those two things take place, God is glorified. We read that in Ephesians 4. So with that brief introduction, number one, look at your notes, your sermon notes. Number one, the first way we accomplish these three goals of the glory of God, the salvation of souls, and the sanctification of the church is by being involved in a spiritual ministry. Because those three goals are spiritually driven. How can you glorify God and see souls saved 
and sanctify the saints, or you yourself be sanctified, unless there's spiritual life there in the local church. You cannot and I cannot accomplish these three goals without coming into contact with life, with spiritual life, imbibing it and giving it back out. Jesus is concerned with the quality of life and doctrinal purity of every local church. If you don't have quality spiritual life and doctrinal purity, the spirit rarely will be at work in such a church. Remember the spiritual lessons we learned from Christ's seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. Every single issue in those seven letters to the seven churches relates to the maintenance and increase of spiritual life. Using the standards that Christ applies to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, what would our Lord's opinion be of the quality of of any local church. It's a standard we must often use in discerning the condition and effectiveness of the local church, mm -hmm. our local church and every local church. If you sense weakness and a loss of life, at least you can be praying for that life to be renewed and to return. God has not given any of us a ministry of condemnation where we go around like police officers with spiritual rulers measuring other believers' lives according to our own view or our own life or even the scripture. Because the Bible teaches in the New Testament that we will be confronted with the sins and the weaknesses and imperfections of other, other believers at one point or another. But the Bible also teaches how we are to respond to those weaknesses with love, with patience, forbearance, long-suffering, and much intercession. Yes, there is a place for rebuke and admonishment, but usually that's after much long-suffering and patience and prayer. <clears throat> Only a spiritual ministry can accomplish the three goals that God has for every local church. The scripture says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Psalm 127.1. The Holy Spirit must be here building this house spiritually, erecting a superstructure that will be strong and not weak. A superstructure built upon a strong foundation, which is Jesus Christ. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It is the Spirit of God that enables us to maintain a spiritual ministry here at Christ Bible Church. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Paul says, but let each one take heed how he builds on this foundation. For no other foundation can be laid. If Christ lays a foundation of salvation in your life and mine by the power of God's spirit, changing you and I from the inside out, bringing in new life, he also must continue through sanctification through individual growth, and through our church life, our body life, build with the same spiritual properties a holy superstructure by the power of the Spirit of God. You and I must be concerned about that. We must be praying about that. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Now note the text in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, where we read, coming to him... As to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. There is a lot in this text that relates to our theme of a spiritual vision for the local church. But I want you to notice the very graphic and stark metaphor of a living stone. That's contradictory, isn't it? Go outside here and pick up any stone and tell me that it's living. No, all stones are absent of any kind of life. But God chooses the metaphor of a stone. Does a stone have any life in it? No. He chooses one of the most dead things in the entire world 
to illustrate something very important concerning the local church. He wants to bring out a critical attribute of the local church that all the members must have in the forefront of their minds. And this contradiction of a living stone is designed to show that you and I have no life in ourselves, but we are raised in newness of life in Christ. Christ is our life. The Holy Spirit empowers us in a spiritual realm to hold a spiritual ministry that will bring forth spiritual fruit. And if the Holy Spirit and our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't accomplish the spiritual purposes he has for the local church in and through us, it will not be done by our religious activities devoid of the presence of the Spirit of God. Didn't, didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. life? He is the life. And the Holy Spirit is life. There are three things in our text identified as spiritual. Notice it. He says, first, a spiritual house. Again, using the metaphor of a house. In God's spiritual house, that is the gathering of the body, there are spiritual activities to be done by spirit-filled members. Worship mm. is to be done by members who are filled with the Spirit. The Old Testament temple the Old Testament tabernacle, again, are metaphors of you and I as believers. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This assumes and presupposes that we have the Spirit of God in us, inside of our bodies, in our minds, quickening our spirit so that when we gather in worship, having been cleansed and freshly washed by the blood of Christ, we can worship in the spirit we can be joyful in the house of the lord offering up spiritual sacrifices as a holy body freshly purified by the spirit of god both in heart and in conscience and so spiritual activities are regulated by the spirit of god in the local church and therefore you and i must always be very conscious and aware that when we gather as a body, we need to be as equipped and as holy by the power of the Spirit because we are corporately joined one to another and with the Lord Jesus Christ so that the Spirit of God can drive this dynamic called worship so that we don't just fall back with dead formalism and lapse into a ritualism that eventually led Jehovah to say to the Jews, your sacred assembly is an abomination to me. So we must have on the forefront of our minds, God uses the metaphor in the Old Testament of, of those blinders that they put on horses and the phylacteries, that the, the leather straps that the Jews wrapped around their hands, the men, and their foreheads to always keep them mindful because those straps are uncomfortable they make you think about those stra the straps when they're on you very often they're uncomfortable so that you're reminded what are you supposed to be doing in the temple you've got these straps on you're in the temple with the men and the and the women are there in the court of the women but the men wrap the straps what are you supposed to do? we're praying we're praying we're supposed to be praying and so we are the temple of the living God. We don't gather as a church and wrap leather straps around our hands and foreheads. Why? We don't need to. We have the Spirit of God inside of us. We are the temple of the living God. And the Spirit of God is the greatest one who reminds us of our spiritual priorities. He reminds us. He reminds us. So we're a spiritual house. There are spiritual activities that are to take place in this church. We know that, but they cannot devolve into rank, dead formalism. If spiritual activities don't maintain some level of regularity, this is displeasing to God because he designed the church 
to constantly be engaged and involved and participating in spiritual activities so that sanctification and edification can take place so that ultimately God can be glorified. God must, that the goal for you and I in going to church is not so that we can feel good when we leave. There's a much higher goal. Worship, the preaching of God's word, the prayer meetings, the singing, the worship exercises and gatherings centered around the, the primacy of the teaching and preaching of God's word are designed to glorify God. And the only way God can be glorified is by bringing forth fruit, spiritual fruit. Mm -hmm. And the way we bring forth spiritual fruit, and now I'm going back in the other direction, is that we engage, we are involved spiritually. And to do that, we need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. But the second thing in the text says that we're a holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. Look at it. Verse 5. We're a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. In other words, the members and the leaders are to be holy. And what do priests do? What is their primary job? The Old Testament priests, the Levites. They serve the Lord full time, don't they? And they offer up spiritual offerings through the animal sacrifices, ritual cleansing, everything they did, which signified were types and and figures of the Lord Jesus Christ signify that they were involved in spiritual activities. Everything they did had a spiritual metaphor connected with it. In the temple, the Old Testament furniture in the temple, all of the furniture was typical of some kind of spiritual lesson or the Lord Jesus Christ in one of his attributes or roles. And now in the New Testament, we are the priests, believers. It's called the priesthood of all believers. Do we not read in scripture that we are a kingdom of priests? And what do priests do? They offer up spiritual sacrifices. Therefore, our main job is to engage spiritually. To be involved in our spiritual responsibilities, number one, with the Lord. Holy priesthood. And as a holy priesthood, offering up sacrifices spiritually to the Lord through worship, through prayer, through devotion, through godliness, through holiness, through spiritual mindedness, through purity of thought, purity of heart, through gracious words and edifying speech, all stimulated by the Spirit of God that has been freshly renewing the graces that have been deposited within us at conversion, we become channels of spiritual life to everyone around us. And the Spirit brings liberty. So when we're called upon to be a source of edification and sanctification to others, we're not stumbling with our words. There are verses, competing verses, in the forefront of our mind to choose from, to offer, to share. When we're called upon to be a channel of spiritual life, we're able to quickly have compassion. The wisdom of God enables us to see what kind of gracious ministry we are to dispense at that moment to those around us. There's no hesitation, very little hesitation. Amen? Amen. A holy priesthood. But then thirdly, it says that in a spiritual house filled by holy priests, they offer up what? Spiritual sacrifices. The spiritual sacrifices, when you boil it down, when you reduce them to its essence, is intense love and worship and prayer to the Lord. God is not interested in externals. The Old Testament is one big lesson reminding us that if all we have is religious externals, we are rejected from serving God. God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance. He says, Ren your hearts and not your garments. And so the Lord Jesus brought out this 
phenomenal, phenomenal teaching that he reduced to two verses in the New Testament. Sharing it with a Samaritan Gentile woman, he summarized the entire spiritual priority of the Old Testament when he said, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. All God was doing with the Jews in the Old Testament is that he was seeking them to worship him in spirit and in truth. He was constantly beckoning them back to their first love, to seek him for who he is, to love him for who he is, a holy, compassionate, loving, righteous God who forgives iniquity, who saves dead souls, who raises up those who are cast down. He says, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It's the only qualification he puts in this verse of, of, of worship or the primary one, but it's the only one mentioned here. We must worship, worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. If we have everything else connected with external worship, we have music, we have hymnals, we have wonderful externals in our worship, but we lack worship in spirit and in truth, we've missed the whole boat. So maintaining spiritual life is a major doctrine in the New Testament. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is in, indispensable to maintaining spiritual life in the church. This is the way we glorify God. We're Christians. We are believers. We have been saved. God has given us many tokens throughout our lives of his love, his presence in our life, and the forgiveness of our sins. Yes, we have to live in this world and earn a living and do things, walk around on this terra firma for a little while. But spiritual life, being acquainted with it, being renewed in it regu regularly is indispensable to a local church if we're to be faithful to God. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This idea of spiritual life is taught in many metaphors in the Bible, which stresses the need to maintain spiritual life. Remember the vine and the branches? In John 15, the Lord said, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He said earlier in the same book of John, He who feeds on me will live because of me. The other metaphor is that of the human body. Without connectedness, our whole body would fall apart. The arms would fall off, the legs would fall. Connectedness is essential. Union with the members, one with another, and then attaching the body to the head mm -hmm. is critical for the body to function the way it's supposed to. We read, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. We were all joined, plunged, connected mm -hmm. together, and then to Christ. In Ephesians 4, we read that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The underlying thesis of this idea is that every part does its share spiritually for the effective working of the body that leads to the growth of the body. He's talking about spiritual growth, not numerical growth. Mm -hmm. For there to be growth, spiritual growth, not just to sustain and maintain life, but to grow and increase spiritual life, Every joint, every member of the body must do its part and in be involved spiritually. Spiritually. Or the growth will be stunted and stifled. Every part does its share 
which causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So, today I would remind you, wherever you may be lacking or fall short in the area of doing your share spiritually, participating in the spiritual activities of the church, edifying one another in love, praying together, all of these things, Go to the Lord and have dealings with Him about it. He's ready to forgive and cleanse. Well, you're already forgiven. He's ready to cleanse and restore you to that place of being a channel of life that will edify other believers every time you get around them. And so these metaphors teach us that life comes from Jesus Christ and is renewed by Jesus Christ and must be maintained afterward. This idea of going backwards the New Testament constantly warns believers about going backwards. But going backwards does not happen without a decrease of spiritual life. And it doesn't happen quickly. Usually it happens incrementally by a loss of spiritual life. And then other thoughts, negative thoughts, thoughts of apostasy, thoughts of doubt, which lead to backsliding and then apostasy would come in and dominate the thinking. But going backwards is something that we are warned about as a local church over and over again. Hundreds of times in the Bible, but most of those times in the New Testament. The very theme of the book of Hebrews, one of the major themes, is to persevere in the faith, spiritually speaking. Spiritually. The Jews are still a nation... They still have a culture, even when they were without a homeland and a corporate government, they still identified themselves as Jews in their culture and in their religious heritage. God, the Jewish nation has been around for about 3,500 years. When Abraham was first called out of Ur of the Chaldees. But for most of that time, they've only been an organizational shell. They have not been pleasing to God. But as we read earlier, the veil is taken away in Christ. And so the church can suffer the same demise. We can be relegated to just a shell. But everyone who has the Spirit of God ultimately at one time or another, has zeal for the house of God, has zeal for the weightier matters of the law, the spiritual priorities of the Lord. And if we lose sight and we lose the vision, we can get it back again. And so these metaphors teach us that life comes from Jesus Christ. Life that is renewed. The inward man is being renewed day by day. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. This idea of renewal comes up over and over and over again. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Both Old Testament and New Testament Teach that the Spirit of God, when a believer sins, doesn't leave us. He exists to renew that which grows weak and tired and weary. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. In 1 Peter 2, 4, our text reads, Coming to Him as Amen. to a living stone. When we return to Christ, when we come to Christ, this dead flesh, this weak, weary, tired, old believer becomes a living stone again. In my spirit, I'm renewed. The spirit is willing. The spirit becomes renewed, even though this treasure is in earthen vessels, even though my body by itself is dead. It's weak. It's weary. But we come to him as a living stone, just like Paul said, that he praises God for his afflictions. He glories in his weakness. He's that living stone. In his weakness, he takes pleasure in his infirmities. In his infirmities, he knows that he will, by the power of the Spirit, be raised up to be a living stone 
sooner or later as he returns to the Lord for fresh grace. Fresh grace. Amen. Amen. We need life. We need the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. The distinctive feature of the new covenant is that ministry is empowered and regulated by the Holy Spirit. None of us, I'm sure, have forgotten that. We all know it, but we all grow weak and we're weary. And the Lord Jesus is our great high priest. Our great high priest. This spiritual ministry is in contrast with the old covenant, which is characterized primarily by the dead letter of God's word, which was not very often empowered by the Holy Spirit to create life. And Peter read earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Jesus said that the law came through Moses. It was a law and a letter of condemnation that exposed sin, that made you feel bad, that produced a guilty conscience. But grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we have a ministry of the Spirit, the Spirit that renews our weakened love for the Lord Jesus Christ, that fans the flames of graces that ebb and flow from day to day and restores that which is sagging and weakening and lacking. We also read, secondly, that we have in the New Testament the priority of a balanced ministry. When we talk about balance, we're talking about equality in weight and parts. That's the dictionary definition. And so translating that into a priority for the local church, we would say we have need for balance in having an equal emphasis upon the ministry of the word and the ministry of the spirit. If you only have an emphasis on the ministry of the word, you can become dead orthodox in your approach to worship and service. And most of your energy is uh, residing in zeal for pure doctrine. That's a good thing, and we need pure doctrine. But the Holy Spirit helps us temper that zeal for sound doctrine with wisdom. And wisdom is peaceable. Wisdom comes to us and enables us to apply the Word of God, to share the Word of God in a way that quickens life in those that hear it, that joins the letter with the Spirit, that joins just the dead letter with the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit that ultimately quickens others with life who hear us and who are ministered to by us with the word of God. We need both, the spirit and the word. We need to preach the whole counsel of God. But it's easier to read and study the word than it is to pray for grace from the spirit. We don't want to drift into a place of hyper-intellectualism. With, a, with an absence of love and joy in our lives and an absence of them in our church. We don't want that. On the other hand, if the power of the Holy Spirit is present in the church, yet the ministry of the word is shallow and unfaithful in preaching the whole counsel of God, then believers will starve for truth. They'll become spiritually weak mm-hmm. and hindered in their growth and become susceptible to false teaching. Both the word and spirit are necessary for a sound, balanced church. And a problem happens when you have one without the the other. The word of God alone is not sufficient to build the church. J.C. Ryle, one of my favorite authors, likes to quote Adolf Safer in the 19th century, who was a close friend of Charles Spurgeon. He was a Jewish believer who was converted as a rabbi and became a pastor eventually when he trusted Christ as his Lord and Savior. 
Adolf Safer wrote that we take the Bible and sometimes put it on an altar and worship it, and we commit bibliolatry. In other words, without the power of the Spirit of God, like the Pharisees, we can make a really big deal about the Word of God, which they did. They were the orthodox caretakers of the oracles of God in their day. But they did not have the Holy Spirit. And therefore, they did not have the ability to apply the Word of God appropriately with grace and love and mercy and compassion and kindness at the appropriate time. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now, lest you think the Apostle Paul is denigrating or disparaging the word of God, he's not. What he's saying is you need the Word of God, but you also need the Spirit of God to be working together in our church and in our individual lives. You need balance. <clears throat> Jesus told the Pharisees, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. The Pharisees had the Word of God, but they lacked the Holy Spirit. They were caretakers of the oracles of God, but they were not born of the Spirit. They made an idol of the Bible. They put it on an altar and worshipped it, but did not have the Holy Spirit because they did not know Jesus Christ. When you don't have the Holy Spirit, the Bible can become an end unto itself, and you can miss Christ. This is the sad plight of a massive amount of unconverted religious people who are members of churches throughout the United States and the world. This has always been the bane of the church. When lacking the Holy Spirit, even one's perspective on the Bible itself can change into being just a religious textbook, a source of tradition, or a dead book. And this is why you and I, I don't have to tell you this, you and I get concerned during our devotions when we fall asleep and we're not getting any, anything out of our reading, we're not getting edified, we're not getting blessed, we're not seeing Christ in the Word, we're not getting quickened, we're not getting stirred up and convicted, where we begin reading the Bible as a story. The Spirit of God needs to assist us. We ought to pray, Lord, open thou our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Amen. So we need balance. Is your church a balanced church of word and spirit? Well, Jesus provides the grace for a balanced ministry. Who also made us ministers of the new covenant. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We need the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and quicken and revive life in me and in you every day. And however long it takes until you sense, okay, Lord, you're using your Word by the leading of your Spirit to, to transform me, to quicken me. Okay, now, now I'm there. Now and there, however small a time that would be. As George Mueller used to say, never begin your day without joy in the Lord. Thirdly, a discerning ministry. That's a priority here. We need discernment. What the Bible, or the dictionary rather, defines discernment as the faculty of discrimination, acuteness of judgment and understanding. And this ability to discern to through core issues, two core issues, spiritual issues, is applied by the Holy Spirit who provides enlightenment, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, who provides spiritual understanding and gives the hidden wisdom of God so that we can discern evil from good, good from evil. We can discern the core spiritual issues that are at work in just about every single thing possible even at work, 
even while you're driving. There's always spiritual issues going on, and we need discernment from the Holy Spirit to understand what's going on in relationships, what's going on at work, what's going on everywhere. But especially we need discernment when it comes to discerning the truth. We, we help people as Christians to understand the truth and to abide in it. Therefore, we ourselves need discernment to know what truth to apply at what particular time to what particular person. In the last days we read that many will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. Are you establishing the truth? Can you identify a false teacher? Can you help somebody out of darkness into the light of the truth of God's word? So we need discernment into truth. We also need discernment into a loss of spiritual life. The Spirit of God helps us to discern when we're growing weak. Because God says we're not to, to be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So if you can't discern a loss of life, you will, you will quickly rise to a superficial place in your in your walk and relationship with the Lord and you won't be able to discern the weighty life and death issues issues of faithfulness in serving the Lord that you are confronted with you won't be able to discern them you'll be short-sighted even to blindness you'll be temporary blinded you need discernment when a loss of spiritual life takes place in your walk with God number three we need discernment in the will of God Paul prayed that the Colossian believers would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. They did not automatically get a level of wisdom and spiritual understanding to know the will of God in every area of their life. And some of us in this room, some of us listening on the internet, need wisdom. You need decisions to be made about very important matters. And that wisdom and that spiritual understanding will not be given unless you seek the Lord, unless you read and meditate on his word, unless the spirit of God opens your heart and your eyes to understand the will of God in a particular area of your life. We need discernment about false teachers. We need discernment about many things and how to witness to unsaved people. But fourthly, to have a spiritual vision and maintain a spiritual ministry, we need a determined ministry. Mm. What do I mean by a determined ministry? Well, I mean determined to persevere to the end of our lives. Mm. Why? Because it's not how you start that matters. It's how you finish. And true believers will finish. But through human responsibility, God works his power to enable us to accomplish his will. We need determination to recover from a snare. We need determination to learn from our mistakes. We need to determination to overcome every sin, obstacle, and setback that hinders us in our relationship with the church, that takes away a mindset of zeal in our relationship as a member of the church and substitutes a complacent outlook towards our relationship with the church. So we make excuses for attending certain meetings and after several weeks or several months because the Holy Spirit has not given us a strong determination to obey him in our relationship with the means of grace outwardly like our relationship to the local church. We find ourselves just barely doing the basics. Remember therefore from where you have fallen Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent, God tells the church in Revelation 2. These things says he who has the seven spirits and the seven stars. Mm -hmm. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Go back to the way you were before when you had this zeal for every command in the Bible. But today we're talking about our relationship to the local church. When you do that, 
And I'm not talking about those who have legitimate reasons for not doing certain things. Mm. I'm not talking about those people. But when you are given grace of the Spirit to be determined to obey God in everything, you won't be late to church. There won't be excuses about attending the prayer meeting, about giving to the Lord's work financially, about every other thing. You'll see those things not as duties that you have to do, but as wonderful opportunities through which you can glorify God. Glorify God. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Number five, a praying ministry. Mm. A praying ministry. I'm not going to spend much time on this. I've already touched upon the importance of corporate prayer. But Spurgeon said a prayerless church is a dead church. And if that's the measure, then we're close. We're getting close to that deadness part. Not completely dead, but where is our life? Where is our spiritual life? No man can progress, Spurgeon says, in grace if he forsakes prayer. That's private prayer as well as corporate mm -hmm. prayer. If you're really maintaining a healthy private prayer life, you'll be more often found in the prayer meeting as well in the local church. Brethren, we will never see, Spurgeon says, much change for the better in our churches until the prayer meeting occupies a higher priority for Christians. Mm -hmm. The condition of the church may be accurately measured by its prayer meetings. So the prayer meeting is a grace-ometer and from it we may judge the amount of divine working among the people. If God be near a church, listen, if God be near a church, mm -hmm. it must pray. And if he is not there, one of the first tokens of his absence will be slothfulness in prayer. I know that's painful to hear. It's, it's humbling. Mm -hmm. But it's true. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And they continued steadfastly, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, we read in Romans, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And then number six, and lastly, a Christ-centered ministry. The church is to be consumed with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this has been a growing, heavy burden on my heart over the last several years in particular. There is something desperately wrong when Christ is no longer the focus of the church's attention and affection. Jesus is to be central and supreme in the church's worship and teaching and activities, our activities. The pastor cannot be the one that you rely upon to quicken fresh love and zeal for Christ, you also have a responsibility to be recharged by the Spirit in your private devotions, in your walk with Him. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Almost every prayer that I offer, God has convicted me <clears throat> that we begin with a view of the majesty of God, rather than just delving right away into prayer requests. I exhorted uh, the leadership at Family Radio about this some weeks ago. And they have a wonderful new program called a prayer system, where they encourage listeners to pray for other listeners' prayer requests. And that's a very good thing. But I, in, in one of my opportunities to remind the leadership there, I said, look, the Lord Jesus in the Lord's Prayer taught that there are six elements of prayer, including praise and worship, uh, praying that we wouldn't be tempted, praying or petition for our needs, our daily needs, 
petition or asking for things we need is just one thing, one element of what comprises true prayer. One of the first things that will lack in our prayers when our spiritual priorities diminish in our individual and corporate walk is the idea of a vision for the majesty and glory of God in prayer. How can we begin praying without praising Him and thanking Him? Even going into some of, some of the many, not a lot because we can only pray so long publicly, but some of the glorious attributes of the Lord that come up in our thinking during prayer. We're reminded of his goodness. We're reminded of his mercy. We're reminded of his righteousness. And if we've been in recent prayer in our prayer closet, those attributes will be fresh on our minds and they will be quick to come up in our public prayers, therefore. A Christ-centered ministry. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. And in that chapter that, again, was read earlier, 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed formed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we grow older as a church, we're getting ready to, to celebrate our 30th anniversary. God has been so good to us. Mm -hmm. And now we can look back and say, wow, you know, it, we haven't been going just for a year or two. We've got an extended track record here at Christ Bible Church of 30 years. And in that track record, as we test and evaluate our faithfulness to try to be a discerning church, to see our track record as Christ does and compare it to where we are now. I can say as, as one of the elders here that we've been very faithful in upholding the, written, the standards of the written word of God and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrines of God's word. We've been, we've been doing pretty good at persevering spiritually as well. We've been doing pretty good in all the areas that are easiest to the flesh. Mm. But in this area of maintaining a spiritual ministry, a balanced ministry, a discerning ministry, a determined ministry, a praying ministry, a Christ-centered ministry, so that we can bring forth more fruit in achieving the goals that God has for us, the glory of God, the salvation of souls, and the sanctification of the saints, we're struggling in that area. We haven't failed. We haven't gone backwards completely, but we're struggling right now in, in some of these areas of maintaining our spiritual vision. This isn't the end of the world. There's tremendous hope and opportunity to recover and to strengthen those things which remain. But we must go back to the source. We must go back to the head of the church, the one who established the church and built the church and enabled us to bring forth fruit and to glorify him all these years. Mm -hmm. We need to evaluate, is a spiritual ministry on the forefront of my mind and a great priority in my thinking and in my daily activities and weekly activities? A balanced ministry, am I spending an equal amount of time in prayer and in the word of God? Do I, do I see the spirit of God working in my life? A discerning ministry. Have I lost discernment so that I find myself getting shocked and surprised by such lack of insight into things spiritually, mm -hmm. frequently in my life? A determined ministry. Am I complacent? Am I lukewarm? Am I not as zealous for the glory of God and the salvation of souls and my brother's welfare, my sister's welfare? And my love of them. Have I lost that determination to persevere in things spiritual? A praying ministry. What has taken the place of time spent in private prayer and corporate prayer? Is there something competing? And is there something very covetous? 
for my time that I spend with my precious Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in prayer. Whatever it is, destroy it. Cast out that covetousness. And lastly, a Christ-centered ministry. Come before the Lord Jesus and trust in him. And ask him to give you grace to make him once again the lover of our never-dying souls. And to give us more love for him. And then if you do these things and the Holy Spirit enables you to maintain these six things, your spiritual vision will be restored. And fruit will come forth in the very, very near future. The Lord Jesus has done this so many times in our lives. We've been going 30 years, but we cannot rest on our laurels. We cannot rest on past grace on past victories, on the fruit that we've borne in the past, and then have this attitude develop very subtly that we're going to coast into heaven. That's, a, that's the Arminian view, once saved, always saved. I'm sa I got saved 43 years ago, or whenever you got saved, however many years that was ago, and no, nobody can take my salvation away, but it really doesn't matter what I'm doing now for the Lord. Am I faithful now? Am I, am I obedient now? Because I've got my fire insurance, so I could just, from that time, passively kind of schlep along and enter the kingdom. No. We need, to, we need to believe that God will keep us and he will preserve our salvation because we cannot lose it. But we also need to actively work out our salvation with fear and trembling and have all of these graces restored when they are diminished. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your forgiveness, for your patience, and for the countless times that you have proven yourself faithful to your promise to revive us again, to restore us, to bring us back to that place that we've been wanting to come, that place of walking before you in the land of the living, serving you, serving you in your strength, not in our strength, by your grace. Help any one of us who may need that vision restored. Come, come alongside of us and strengthen us, hold us up. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. O great shepherd of the sheep, pray for us. Help us. We look to you. We trust in you. We love you. Lord, you know that we love you, but our flesh is weak. And we need you to come and transplant the mind of Christ, the mind of the spirit afresh into our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.